justice is standing up for those who are oppressed, who um, challenging the system, you know, going against the popular opinion sometimes. Uh, that's all that kind of stuff. And then mercy is caring for those who have been crushed by racism or broken and listening to the stories and giving them a hug and affirming them. Hey, thanks for checking out this video from the Canadian Church Leaders Network. We at CCLN exist to seed a hopeful future for the church in Canada by coming alongside pastors to serve, connect, and resource them as they in turn do the same for their communities. If you're a pastor looking to be further resourced or to connect with more church leaders across our nation who are seeking to learn and lead together, we encourage you to find us on Instagram by searching CCLN or just hit subscribe below. Thanks again for watching this video. We hope it's helpful and encouraging for you. Well, hey, Ho Ming, it's good to be back with you again. Last time we chatted was last August. In this episode, we're recording right now in July, but we're going to release it in August. So it'll be about a full year since our last oh, yeah. conversation. Okay. All right. And I do not think a year ago, we thought that the circumstances would be still in lockdown in Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys doing over there, man? Well, we're jealous of BC because every time I see the news, you guys are ahead of us at least one step. And uh, I don't, so I don't, I don't know what is here, man. <laughs> well, it's... just as we're recording this, we're putting plans for reopening in place. Like we got a huge announcement just yesterday and I'm feeling for pastors right now though, because in each province, in each region, there's like the reality of, of serving your church in lockdown, but then also just the implications of how do you open up and the changes in perception. And you're going to have a church that are still not all comfortable. It's Absolutely. a fascinating time. It is a very fascinating time, and, and I, I would encourage pastors to just learn to be agile and flexible, uh, obviously, number one, to God, and then secondly, to the pulse of, of people, because you do mm. hear around, like, I have friends in Australia, and they were sailing high, for, you know, well right. for, for a while, but now they're back on lockdown. So they, they had to, po you know, um, cancel their in-person ministries uh, for at least two, three weeks now. So I thought they were all clear of it, but but clearly not. So So we have to be flexible and you have to really kind of um, learn that skill. Yeah, absolutely. Now, for those who are still getting to know you, maybe didn't hear that first episode, please go back and give it a listen. I left that conversation wishing that we could have spent more time almost on each subject. So part of it is I want to bring you back. The other reality is between the last time we chatted, there were a number of movements, one of which was Stop Asian Hate. And uh, why don't you give a bit of context to the church you lead? Uh, because I think that helps understand a lot of the conversations we want to have today. Sure. Yeah. So our church was planted in 1985 as an immigrant church. A lot of churches were planted back in those days, especially uh, to reach out to Hong Kong immigrants. You know, there's a huge wave of Hong Kong immigrants in the 70s, 80s and 90s, uh, including my parents. And the reason is because of the 1997 uh, China takeover. You know, Hong Kong was being handed back to China. And now you start you know, if you pay attention to the news, you see all the stuff happening in Hong Kong and China. It's, it's quite volatile. Um, and so a lot of people moved over. And so our church uh, started as an immigrant church about 30 some years ago. But obviously with, with this type of church, it evolves because you always have children. And, and children are, right. are, are, Canadi are Canadian born on the Canadian soul and they speak English like myself and they actually don't speak their mother tongue very well. So then you start having a very complicated situation. And then obviously... In the 90s, um, more and more Mandarin speakers came over. That's different than Hong Kong speakers. Uh, Hong Kong speakers are Cantonese speaking. Uh, Mandarin speakers are a whole new ballgame. So then you start adding a third type of uh, group uh, service ministry to your church. And now you have um, this uh, trilingual kind of church. And so God, out of that, uh, God's been um, doing some pretty crazy things. And mm. uh, we, don't, we don't think it'll end with trilingual. We think that as more immigration comes uh, to Canada, we may have uh, quadlingual or whatever the term is for more and more languages being spoken uh, in, uh, in, in the church. So mm. uh, that's a history of our church. And um, when the stop Asian hate thing came about, uh, obviously that was triggered by the Atlanta shootings yeah. uh, in, in March. And so, you know, we felt as a church, we, we need to speak into the conversation. We have to be part of the conversation. So mm. we did a few things. We spoke about it. Uh, we did a few online dialogues and just started the, the conversation. Yeah. One thing that I thought, uh, there's a number of things you did. And, but one thing I saw that you guys did is it was a post you did, I saw on Instagram and you did ho hosted a bit of a digital space for people to pray and process. 
And uh, I thought that was a really compelling creative response because I know that as movements happen, you know, right now, as we're recording this nationally and uh, definitely a lot in BC, but this is a national conversation, we're asking about our indigenous neighbors Mm -hmm. and, you know, how do we create a space? And sometimes the pressure is to have like a statement Yep. But, and, and a statement might be important, but what I thought was interesting about what you did is you created a space first to care for those in your flock who are processing and grieving themselves. Can you just talk a little bit about that event and maybe, other, and even just sort of like, why, why pull that together and what other things you did to try to pass to your church through that moment? Yeah, that's, that was tricky because um, last year, the big news was George Floyd. And when that yeah. happened, uh, all these people, groups, churches, organizations were putting out statements, you know, condemning um, uh, hatred and racism, and, and rightly so. Um, our church was in a weird, little bit of a weird space because because we we didn't know what to put out. Like, should we put out a statement? <laughs> uh, we, you know, um, we don't know. We didn't know all the facts back then, and and and, and that we were getting some internal pressure. Uh, particularly from younger people to say, hey, 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 you know, like Nike's putting out a statement. <laughs> this church is putting out a statement. How come you, we aren't putting out a statement. And so the next week I went on and I just kind of shared my thoughts, uh, learning yeah. from different people and different voices on the internet and researching a little bit and, and just ex- explaining that it's not a statement, but sort of a reflection about mm-hmm. how we, how we can listen, how we can we do better. But I felt a little bit, I would say a little bit disconnected from that event because you know, I'm an Asian guy. I'm not a, I'm not a black man. And, and, and so, so I didn't, I haven't experienced some of the things in America, obviously. Uh, when Atlanta happened though, it was a different ball game. Then it was yeah. like, okay, you, you, you know, you guys are Asians, you better say something. And I thought, well, we could put a statement, you know, we're a, you know, larger Chinese church. Should we, should we say something? And, um, but I found that, you know, a statement to me wasn't necessarily the most helpful. Like a lot of people mm. were putting them out. I, I felt that reflection is required. Prayer is required. Grieving is required. So we hosted sort of a, a little night where we did talk about some of our experiences first before jumping mm. to conclusions. I, I think uh, it sort of what's, what was interesting is I found a lot of pastors um, really were unprepared for how mm. the church should respond. Um, you know, of course, people have been talking about racism for years and years, but as a whole church and this whole movement again, you know, we, there wasn't so much um, talk about it. So what we did was uh, we hosted a night just to share some of our stories. And uh, what was interesting was like every one of us like hosting and, and dialoguing, you know, had a racist encounter at least one, once or twice, or, or maybe throughout their mm-hmm. life. And, and that was fascinating to hear. Like we've never shared those stories before. It's sort of just, wow. suppress, you just sort of suppress it and like hope it never comes back up again, but it started welling us, in us that um, this idea that we, we have to kind of think through identity on our history and, and not be ashamed of it and mm-hmm. really start talking about it. And cause I think, I could say from my point of view, you know, growing up in, in the evangelical church, like we were sort of, you sort of felt like you deferred to the Western, the, the white church for, for kind of your answers. You kind of, you kind of just listened to read all the books and, and we really were sort of this weird um, kind of a, a mix of um, a mix of uh, you, you know, you're trying to be, you know, like a Chinese church, but at the same time, you're, you're in Canada. So we would mm. sort of listen and, and try to figure things out. But, but after these conversations started happening, I started thinking like, what does the Asian church bring to the table that no other church does? That's sort of where mm. I was kind of going with all this stuff after processing it. So what I'd say, you know, quickly is uh, I think the, what happened in Atlanta sparked something in us uh, to, to really start thinking through what is our voice? And what is our mm. history? What is our experience? And when, wh- how can we benefit Canada? How can we benefit the Canadian church as a whole? So uh, that's, that's just some of my quick thinking. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, man. And, and I, just to lean into a little bit more, like to, for pastors who let's just even speak to like white pastors like me and uh, we have in our congregation, it's, 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 it, I think it's difficult in Canada not to have some minorities in your congregation. I'm here in Vancouver. We'll talk later about building a more multi-ethnic church, but we've got, you know, the whole spectrum in our church. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think one of the questions I faced, if I can be honest, um, is I felt the pressure to respond publicly. And that distracted me from what my heart wanted to do, which was pastor my people through yeah. it. And I remember, I want to shout out, um, 
I won't say his name, but a, a good friend in my congregation that called me to talk about it after the Atlanta shooting. And this is embarrassing. I thought he was calling to tell me I didn't do something right. But what he was just calling was just to talk to me about what he was experiencing. Mm. You know, and that was like, that's a kind of a low point for me as a pastor. Um, that people were hurting and I was distracted by like managing, I don't know. And, uh, and so that really has me thinking, how do I care for those who have experienced all kinds of trauma, including racism, but also to acknowledge that moments like this, and this is something I'm learning and tell me if, if I've got this right, Homing, that while the trauma was always there, when there is a moment like the shooting in Atlanta, it can create like a, a resurfacing of a lot of that pain. And there is an opportunity for the church to care for. So that, that's what happens, obviously, with, you know, right now we're talking a lot about um, the discovery of the mass graves at the residential schools. Mm -hmm. This isn't, quote unquote, a new experience for survivors and their children and their community but this surfaces and brings with it. And then it becomes a question, not just how do we respond publicly, but how do we pastor our people and our neighbors through it? Yeah. You know, you know, the funny thing is that we live in a, an age where social media is, is a factor, you know, and, and social media has this weird thing of, of, uh, you know, positioning yourself, uh, uh, sort of in a certain light and uh, I've always found it strange that people would post on something as serious as the indigenous schools and then the next post is about the ice cream that you found in Vancouver you know like or the downtown Toronto core you love this ice cream and I always found that a little bit strange where back-to-back -back posts you have something that serious the next post is about your dog or, or some ice cream that you ate and and I think social media uh, has that you know I felt the pressure honestly to, to post yeah. something you know and um um, I, I, I think, I think the, the key probably is really taking some time not to, not to, uh, immediately react. I mean, mm. part of it, part of the issue with Atlanta was there's a lot of, you know, um, narratives going on. Yeah. There, the guy was, you know, doing something racist. He was also a misogynist, you know, and, and also on top of that, he was probably had a lot of mental issues. So there's a lot of things going on and it was, it's easy to just decry him as, as a simple racist and that's it. Um, but uh, I wanted to, for the Atlanta thing, I, I remember just kind of thinking through it, even at our staff level, we had difference of opinions, what we should do. Um, you know, Jason, I wouldn't just encourage you don't, don't overthink it. I mean, it's, you got to do both, you know, you got to kind of lead the church through it, you know, whether that's, you know, doing a podcast or a sermon about it or, or kind of talk, but, but also sort of pro helping people process the pain. I think you could do both. Um, mm. I tried to sort of do both, uh, you know, with our church as well, realizing yeah. that not everybody, so there are so, definitely some people in my church are posting a lot, posting stop Asian hate, you know, but there are a lot of people that, that weren't posting it. And, um, and uh, so, so the problem is the post, the posters usually get all the, uh, the attention. Uh, and sometimes that's not always the best thing. Mm. A lot of people are quiet about it and they didn't want to, they didn't want to speak up. They didn't know what to say. So mm. it takes a while to, to kind of uncover that pain. But yeah, I certainly think um, you need both. What was the experience within your congregation? You'd have lots of different experiences. Some people are deeply grieving. Um, some people not knowing how to respond. What, what, what were you feeling and experiencing in your people? Well, you know, that's a great question. Um, what's interesting is that each people group, I call, we call people groups here. Um, you could say language group, in fact, they respond to different things, you know, different events very differently. Like for Stop Asian Hate in Atlanta, it was primarily the, the ones who are like myself, second generation people that were responding. But if you ask mm. someone from my parents' era, they didn't seem to think over too, over too much about it. Hmm. Um, in that era, to be an immigrant, you got to be resilient and resourceful. And quite frankly, most of the time you were taught to put your head down and work hard. Hmm. And the amount of, you know, racism and, and discrimination that generation and above got pales probably in comparison to what I've ever experienced. And uh, there's a lot of stories in our congregation. But interestingly enough, when you talk to those guys, they'll say it sucked. They'll, they'll say it was terrible. But like we move on, you know, we just kind of have to be resilient. And that's what it took to be an immigrant. You know, mm. it was almost like normalized that I'm going to get some racist comments thrown at me. 
And, um, but you know, we have our dignity, we move on. And so they didn't really seem that interested in talking about it. Um, what they were interested in, well, my parents are very much more interested in are, are talking about what's happening in Hong Kong, what's happening right. in, across the, uh, across the ocean. That's what they were interested in. So they acknowledge it, but they, they didn't seem as riled up as my generation was certainly my generation is posting mm. and getting angry and, and, and talking about justice and, and all that kind of stuff. But if you talk to my parents' generation, they were more interested in other things. They, mm. you know, so that's the funny, I don't want to say the funny, but the interesting thing about, about leading a church like mine is that the, it's not a homogenous group. It, it's definitely very, very um, the difference. There's so many differences in how people see things. So yeah. it's really quite tricky. Yeah. Hmm. And you shared um, a, uh, a bit of your story and some, some reflections on like an IGTV uh, shortly sure. after the Atlanta shooting. And I just really appreciated your heart. And I just love to just call back to a little bit. Um, you shared, you, you even talked about growing up in rural Saskatchewan, your own experience. And then you had like three or four really just compelling like points of application. And what I loved was... Um, it was just, it was really informed by a Christian worldview and your own experience. So there's this, like this coming together. I think you're just uniquely positioned with a lot of integrity to speak to this. Um, but yeah, maybe just highlight some of the, some of what you shared there. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I shared that because I wanted to, to give the congregation a way to understand how to think through their own stories and then put your story in, in the grander scheme of God's story. Because, because if you just look at your own story, it's pretty tragic. But hmm. you put it in God's story, you know, underneath that umbrella, you could see God weaving the pieces together, even in the brokenness and the pain. And, and, and so what I basically shared was, you know, I grew up in Regina. It was, uh, you know, back in Regina in the 80s, it was, you know, it was, you definitely stood out if you were not white. You know, I, I think in my class, we had a, a, an indigenous, you know, uh, you know, girl. We had myself and maybe another Korean. <laughs> Everybody else is white. And so I would walk through to my school. You'd have to walk through this other school. I don't know how, why that worked out. And, and basically my story is, you know, I would get these racist comments thrown at me every day. And it was like, just terrible. And I, I mean, at first you just don't realize what's happening because you're a child. Right. Then yeah. you start getting the message loud and clear that you are different. Please go away. You know, you're not mm. welcome. Uh, you know, and one day I think I remember just going home and I was crying. I was just like, I think it finally got to me after like, I don't know, days or years or months of this stuff. And I remember my father did something that I always remember. And, and normally I don't remember anything from grade two or grade one, but, and, and again, I guarantee you don't, don't do this today. Okay. It's not going to fly well, but my father took me by the hand the next day, walked to the school. I pointed out the bully. He basically told him to come with him, which is like, nice. Is, yeah. and we went to the principal's office and he just told the principal what happened. The principal like let this kid have it. And he never bothered me again. Wow. So, so, you know, the story is like, you need someone to stand in the gap and stand up hmm. and speak up for you. Now, number one, that was my father. That wasn't easy. He could have just said, just turn the other cheek. Like, just don't, don't, let's just avoid this. Let's find another route to school. Right. But he did it. And um, number two, the principal, he could have been like, oh, it's nothing. Just let's not talk about this. But he, he reprimanded the kid and he, the kid never bothered me again. And mm. kind of showed me that you, you this is how you got to deal with some of the stuff that's happening. You, mm. you got to, um, you know, I, and I talked about, you got to enact some mercy and justice. And, and they're a little bit different sort of justice is standing up for those who are oppressed, who are um, challenging the system, you know, going against the popular opinion sometimes. Um, that's all that kind of stuff. And then mercy is caring for those who have been crushed by racism or broken and listening to the stories and, giving them a hug and, and firming them. And, and, and I, I found that my father did both. And, and he, like, it's like, he never spoke about it again. He, I, I don't even think he remembers doing it, but um, through that process, I learned um, that, um, that I buried that event. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. until Atlanta that I brought, I, I kind of started thinking about that. Um, but I, I also realized that I think racism has a lot of profound effects on people like mm -hmm. subtle and profound. And, yeah. and a lot of it's, is actually subtle. You don't realize it until you start thinking about your journey and thinking through the brokenness of it. And, you know, sort of the, I kind of shared that I, you know, sort of part of me is always 
um, kind of, do, I do feel like a little bit of the outsider, you know, even though I was born in Canada and, and I, my, my English, I think is pretty good, you know, <laughs> like, like I kind of feel like the outsider in, in most circ social circumstances. Um, and I didn't really kind of realize I, I am more comfortable around Asians because like they're like me. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm more protected in that environment. I feel protected in that environment. I feel like I could be myself. And so it's taken quite a few decades for me to sort of come out of my shell. And even with with you, Jason, feeling like you're listening, you're here to not judge and just be a friend to me. That 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 matters a lot to me. You, mm -hmm. you, might, not, you might not realize it. You might you might take that for granted with other pastors you talk to. But for someone like me, it does matter. And wow. um, so I, I do appreciate this conversation and, and just having me on and just chatting. Um, yeah. And I, I find that um, it does have an effect and it's, I'm still processing quite a bit of it. I talked about the fact that I was thinking about this kid that was doing the bullying and I was kind of thinking like, like, where did he get this idea from? Like, you know, obviously he, he's getting it from media, he's getting it from his parents, but it's, it's, it's taught and caught, you know, it's, it's, and we got to be very careful of what we're saying at home even the little jokes that we make that we don't think are racist or bad. I'm not saying, you know, fake it, you know, at home and, and stuff, but be careful with your words and in your attitudes because your children will pick those up quickly. Because mm -hmm. this boy didn't come to school one day and said, you know, said like, I'm going to pick on this kid because I'm just going to pick. Right. Him. I think he was taught somehow that other people are not great, you know, and, and they should be kind of made fun of. So, you know, you know, I, I wish the story, the ending of the story was like, we became friends, but we just sort of avoided each other. And I never saw him again. Like he was kind of maybe scared. He's after. Maybe he's listening <laughs> right now. And actually, you know what? Can you imagine if I could pull him out right now? Yeah. Like a, yeah. A, I, a talk show thing. Yeah. We've actually got him on the show right now. <laughs> I, I would, uh, I would give him a hug, man. I would say, yeah. I would say, listen, you know, you know, I, if he's not a Christian, I would preach in the gospel because I, at the end of that conversation, I did talk about how really, to me, it shows the gospel is so needed in this conversation. Because mm. you can like root out the, the racist behaviors, which is I think the media is doing a lot of is like, basically, there's messages, stop being a racist. <laughs> and it's like, kind of, I don't think human beings work that way that we don't have a, a switch that's just, you know, makes us change. I think, I think the gospel is, is, is important, because it, it hits the foundation of why we do certain things we do. Namely, that we're sinners and we and racism is this kind of really nasty sin where we think like our skin color elevates us above mm. someone else, you know, and we all kind of have at one point done that where we we elevate ourselves because of our academic achievement or our wealth or the clothes we wear or how well we speak, you know, we elevate ourselves above someone else. And it's only in the gospel that says, like, everyone is a sinner, everyone you know, is no one is righteous. That's what Romans three says. And that we all need a savior. And if we all need a savior, then, then we all need a savior. You cannot mm. look at anyone else and say that you are above them at any point in your life. So I think the gospel is critical to this conversation. And I, um, when I talk about racism, I got to point out the gospel to anybody. So it's not just, mm. let's stop being racist guys. Let's look at the good in other people. Well, I think you got to start looking at the bad in yourself first, you know, before you look in the good in other people and the bad in other people. So look mm -hmm. at yourself first, look in the mirror. And then I think that, you know, you're going to see the, some of the answers start coming out. Hmm. Thanks so much for sharing all that, man. I'm super grateful. Um, I was chatting with you earlier. There's a couple stats that um, a lot of people hear this, um, but the government's projecting that about 57% of Canada's immigrants will be Asian by 2036, 57%. Yeah. That's 15 years from now. And about 46% of Canada will be either immigrants or second generation individuals, 46%. And wow. in, in, in the Metro Vancouver area, um, you know, more than 51% of people in Metro Vancouver, or maybe just about 51%, this is 2016 data, are uh, non-Caucasian mm -hmm. people of color. And, uh, you know, I think it's something like 42% of Metro Vancouver uh, would be Asian. And uh, so I'm thinking about what it means to build a multi-ethnic church. I'm also thinking about the landscape of the church in Vancouver, um, because you can go into one church in Vancouver and it would look like yours, 95% Asian. You can go into another one, 95% yeah. uh, hipster Caucasians wearing plaid in the winter, you know, with tight jeans or whatever, you know, not tight jeans anymore. See, I'm dating myself now with yeah. baggy jeans. Baggy and, you know, jeans, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, but you know what I mean? So there's, this, there's a sense by which it's actually hard to find a truly multi-ethnic church 
where you have a lot of like mono ethnic church uh, as a or primary. So, I mean, what I want to do is enter into a conversation with you because I really believe, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, that churches like Richmond Hill are not just an important but essential part of the fabric of the church, uh, especially as we welcome and make safe places for people to find community. But it's interesting when you contrast that with the idea of building increasingly multi ethnic churches. You know, there's an interplay between those types of ideas. I just love to hear your reflections on that. Yeah, I mean, this has been my whole life's journey, you know, thinking about my identity, uh, how, how it plays out in a church and what kind of church I'm a part of. Um, I will say when, when in the 70s and 80s, when churches were built, uh, for, like my parents' generation, you just sort of just built it. It was very natural. You know, you had a bunch of immigrants coming in. They're not really quite with, you know, Canadian culture. They don't know English that well. So you start forming communities that reflect their home country. So in my case, it was, you know, Hong Kong speaking, uh, sorry, Cantonese speaking Hong Kong type of, you know, communities. And there are a lot of nuances in their communities, food choices, the way we interact. Uh, and so you built this church and it grew, it grew quite quickly. And, if, and here's another stat to add to that, that there are 500 of these type of churches across Canada. I think about wow. 200, 250 in, 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 in Toronto alone. So you can see like all these churches range from small churches to very large churches. Um, that's the type of church that was built. And, but it's evolving. So the word I've been using is evolving. Uh, there's a lot of people that have been using different language. Like uh, my friend down the States calls it the Chinese heritage church. I, I'm not the biggest fan of that term because I think it is heritage, but I'd like to see forward movement. So mm. I call it like evolving Asian, you know, evolving Asian, evolving Chinese church. It's, you know, taking understanding where you come from, but hey, things are, ch are changing now. And so what fundamentally a lot of these immigrant churches go through is, I would say, a succession of power, uh, you know, and, and that involves culture, power, systems changing from reaching out to one group to reaching out to different groups, including mm. people like myself, who don't think like a Hong Kong immigrant, you know, I don't, as much as my parents don't, don't believe this, you know, they, I don't think like them. I don't, my mother tongue is not Cantonese. So, so, um, change. So, so if you're going to do immigrant churches, you know, it's a wide spectrum of, of, of expressions, but the, the common factor is that you start off with sort of one language groups, uh, one language group, one culture, and it naturally evolves to multiple language groups, multiple cultures, uh, by virtue of simply having children who grow up here. And, uh, you know, it's the funniest thing, Jason, you, you, you may not understand this, but like when I was growing up, the hope was, and I can tell you all those parents, I know, I'm going to get crucified for this, but all those parents were wrong. Like, cause they, they thought sending myself to Chinese school, we keep our heritage. We keep our culture. I could tell you nobody in my, in my demographic, like my generation can really speak Cantonese well. I think what they want is sort of a respect and honor for the culture, which I think mm. I do. I do mm -hmm. deeply respect my parents' culture, and and but I am not of that culture. I cannot speak it. And then don't don't even talk to about my children. They can't even understand the language. At least I can. It's funny because um, that was the hope, right? When you start out as an immigrant, you kind of want to keep your culture. And the idea is that you're almost like a, a fortress. You don't want to call yourself that, but you really kind of are. This little hub, social hub. So I think one of the big things for an immigrant church to move forward with is sort of shifting from you could call it like a social hub to a truly missional community hmm. where, where we're not just about protecting our culture and our identity, but embracing other cultures and learning to work together as one team. That's a totally different conversation. That is a difficult topic, yeah. but I, I can, I mean, I could go on and on for 10 podcasts about this type of thing that I'm living out day to day. Cause I have to mm. live it out <laughs> and, and sometimes suffer through it. So well, let's, let's lean into it a little bit more. Like I'm sure, curious, yeah. like I'll, I'll maybe try to parse it a little bit. I'll attempt to parse it out. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, what about the unique opportunity? So talking about this, the, the rate of immigration in Canada. So for those yeah. first generation immigrants, what is the best way for us to serve both those who are coming with a Christian faith? But then also there's an evangelistic opportunity as well. So what, what can the church, so not just Richmond Hill, but like my church, your church, the church do to best serve uh, this, this large percentage of the Canadian population? Well, I, I think it's an and situation rather than an or. What I mean mm -hmm. by an and is I think we need churches like the way, um, but also churches like, like my church. 
because not all immigrants are not all the same, you know, like they, some of them are very comfortable in saying, Hey, we want to try our hand out in English. We want to go get right into the culture, right? Quite a few of them uh, are not like that. And they want to speak their mother tongue. And they, just quite frankly, they don't, they cannot speak English. So you could take a while to, to teach them um, English, but that's just not, it won't take, it'll, it'll be a while. So I think we need both types of churches. Um, we need to keep on planting some immigrant churches. Um, um, we also need to, um, you know, help strengthen, uh, I don't know what you call Western type of churches to embrace immigrants. And uh, yeah. it's not easy. Anytime you embrace someone who's quite frankly different, you got to sacrifice something. Because here's the thing, if, if you truly believe um, your value is multiculturalism, if a, a value is something you're going to bleed for, right, willingly. So some people are just, they'd love the term because it's almost like a, you've hit it, you know, when you're a multicultural type of church. But I would ask humbly people, if you're really serious about it, like you're going to have to sacrifice a lot to reach that culture, in, including most of your own preferences, including the way mm. you talk, including, you know, the cool factor in your church, <laughs> how, how cool or not cool you are in, in the sense of like how hip and, and those, all those kind of things you got to mm. kind of sacrifice. And it's not easy. Sacrificing power is the, probably the biggest one, I would say. The ability mm. to just make decisions and without... Yeah, what do you, know, you mean by that? Well, I think, I think every church has a power structure or system. And certain people are the decision makers. Um, you can reach out to, to immigrants and they can be part of your church. But what that means is, are they attending your church? Or are they going to be part of the lifeblood of your church? And I always look at sort of the, the leadership of the church. If I see, if you say you're a, you're a multicultural church, but... I look at your board of elders, I look at your leaders, and it's like 100% white males, then I really don't know if it is multicultural. I need to see some females in there. I need to see people. And I'm not just talking about tokenism. We just bring a Chinese guy on just to satisfy people. But really sort of a more, a different voice is heard. You know, if you're mm. really truly a multicultural church. And I've said it even in my church. Like, we are trying to be a multicultural church. That means we cannot just have... Chinese speakers on the board. We cannot just have English speakers. You gotta, you gotta have a, a you know, different people, uh, men and women and different cultures on the board and, and on your staff to, to really, to, to really be part of that decision-making process. Because ultimately um, I think power is one of the things that churches don't talk about, but it's pretty much, if you don't deal with those issues, like your church isn't going to go anywhere. So, mm. I mean, it's something I'm learning. It's not a great, like very fun topic, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. Systems, culture, yeah. power, all that stuff has to be talked about. Mm. You, I was on your website earlier and there's two lead pastors of the church. And I know that you, uh, yeah. how does, what's the relationship and interplay between the two of you? Oh man, you got to ask all these tough, good questions. Um, <laughs> well, well, how do I begin? The interplay really is that we have, cultural differences and we have gifting differences and what i mean by that is culturally the other pastor is a guy from hong kong he speaks fluent cantonese i cannot my cantonese is broken it's terrible um when i speak it people it's like a, a pony it's like a, what do you call that a, a tr like a nice party trick like oh wow you can speak some cantonese and it's like okay wow <laughs> that's insulting but i is uh so so he really is sort of more that bridge to that side. He speaks Mandarin and Cantonese a little bit more. Uh, and I obviously, were, I'm with next gen, I'm with English speakers. So in that in itself is, is part of the, the makeup of the church. And then there's gifting. Gifting is, mm. we were divided by gifting. I lead more of the, the strategic teaching vision stuff. He handles a little bit more of the shepherding uh, care stuff. So you, 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 we're sort of divided that way. It's, it's a tricky matrix like kind of a leadership, yeah, yeah. but, but that's sort of what we're doing um, right now as the mm. model of leadership. Yeah. And what's the vision as you, you expressed earlier to become increasingly more multi-ethnic um, um, what challenges are you guys facing in front of you right now? And what kind of steps are you preparing to take to sort of, to see that begin to happen? You talked about other staff members, uh, different ethnicities but what else are you guys wrestling with facing planning towards that well i'll give you a little bit of history when when, when a church sure. is planted uh in the 70s and 80s you have one pastor who's a senior pastor and this guy usually calls the shots 
Um, he's a leader. He's usually, he's almost always from the Cantonese group because they started as Cantonese. So he preaches in Cantonese. He leads in Cantonese. The church evolves. You start adding English Mandarin speakers and maybe eventual other groups. You start bringing in other type of pastors. Now, what really people need to understand is that that system was in place for, the, for two to three decades. When you come to a guy like me, uh, I, I'm a totally different animal. I don't, I'm not a Cantonese speaker. I'm an English speaker. So the natural tendency is people think, you know, you're just going to lead the church in an English speaking kind of manner and everything is a more of a Western style. So what I've been working really hard on the last two years is, again, a not very fun topic, but is to really build a system by which the groups can really work together in a very clear and fair manner. And so that we kind of bring the values and the vision of the church um, in a very united front to the different people groups. Because honestly, mm. most Chinese churches, most immigrant churches, and I can tell you right off the bat, most immigrant churches will almost run like three different churches, mm. right? You got Cantonese doing whatever, English doing whatever, Mandarin doing whatever. We have a joint celebration at the end of the year where we have a really like trilingual type of service and nobody likes it because it's translated and it's, it's, a, it's a total mess. And that was like, that's it. Bye-bye. Right. But really that's not, I think the future, the future is really, I think a church that really operates as one church, but you do have contextualization and uniqueness in each of the language groups. Hmm. So, so that's sort of what I'm working on. Um, that's a challenge though. That is really a challenge because um, you have to determine what are your common you know, the values and probably common vehicles and, and, mm. and, and um, the values got to stay the same in the church or else like you might as well have three churches. The and vehicles be transcultural because, values too. And that's, that's right. A challenge. That's, yeah. that's unique. Right. But also, you know, honor the past, you know, some of these values, like one of our values at our church is resilience and resourcefulness. And that really comes from an immigrant mindset because immigrants mm. are super resourceful and super resilient. They're, they're just built that way. You got to be built that way to survive in Canada, you know, especially in the seventies when you had nobody and you had no money and no friends. So that's one of our, our values from the past. And I hope to bring that to the next generations. But anyway, those are transcultural values, the vehicles and sort of how each congregation deals with different topics, you know, um, and, and the way we minister to people that, that has room for flexibility. So hmm. I hope I'm explaining it right, because if you're listening, you may not understand that if you just go to a monocultural, monocultural church, but it is a reality for an immigrant church, uh, hmm. a big, big reality that uh, I've talked to many, many, many pastors of these type of churches, and they're all looking for a way to kind of move the church forward. It's just brutal because it's not a fun conversation to have. It's to really change how the whole church operates. Hmm. So, um, yeah. It's such an important part of the church in Canada, I think. I've always noticed it. I noticed it most when I started church planting in Vancouver and we did a yeah. bit of a survey. We made a, a database of all the churches in Vancouver. And uh, you mentioned that maybe there's 500 um, yeah. ethnic churches in Canada, or do you say, were you saying 500 Chinese churches in Canada? Chinese churches, no, yeah. not, not so, including the others. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, there's gotta be thousands and we're only talking about 20,000 churches total in Canada. Yeah. So this is a, this is a, a, a real percentage in Vancouver. It's, it's a high contingency and my prayer for the city and what we're contending for is not that our church would grow, but the fabric, the kingdom fabric in the city. So that's churches, even Christian NGOs, uh, Christians working in the marketplace, the fabric, the kingdom fabric of the city would, you know, as a whole become healthier and more yeah, vibrant. That's, yeah, that's great. You know, and that interconnectedness of those. And, and I'm not saying we do everything together all the time. You know, like I think there's sometimes unity looks like let's all do one rally. It's kind of like you described the one, <laughs> the one rally at the end of the yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. And those can be powerful moments and are worth kind of stumbling around because they can be symbolic and can reflect something, but it, it, beneath the, it has to be actually this preferring one another, listening, learning. And so for me, not leading a church like yours, but seeing the, how important it is to the fabric of the church in Vancouver and looking at my city and praying for it. I find myself asking questions like, how do I understand this better? So this is why I'm so grateful just to have a window in, yeah. um, cause I don't know these challenges and to understand it better. So I can encourage my brothers and sisters who are leading these churches. Uh, but then also I'm listening for ways that we can prefer one another, listening for ways that there can be opportunity to serve and support one another. 
And, and that's sort of what's happening here too. It's like, I just got a lot to learn from you and from my other neighbors about trying to reach immigrants in my city. Well, I love what you're saying. I think we got to look at it as a big picture. So less of a competition, but, but more of a, like a very kingdom minded view. Um, and I think this kind of conversation is a first step, understanding each other and um, being okay with, with each other's strengths. Like, I mean, if you think about your church, the way it's a new church, you could really go in, in, in several directions. Like one being, you know, just keep building it the way you are. The other is starting an immigrant, you know, different language service. Now I could tell you that's not easy. That's pretty tough. Um, and definitely there'll be sacrifices made. I mean, you might not be at the right spot to do it. The other way is sort of just working with and knowing pastors of churches where you can bring, you know, if you have immigrants in your neighborhood, like your neighbor, and they're, you could tell they're more comfortable in a certain language and saying, hey, I know a church down the road. Why don't you, my buddy pastors that church, you should go there. Like, um, let me bring you, yeah. I'll bring you to that church and get you connected. Like we, hmm. we, like we had, um, we had a bunch of um, Syrian refugees that we sponsored and, and, um, and rallied our congregation to care for, I think about 10 families or so. And I remember that one of the key things that we did was we pastored with the Farsi speaking church in Toronto. Hmm. And even though the first year we helped them settle down, we, our prayer was that they would go to that church. Now right. we could have said, let's start a Farsi service, but, and eventually we may do that, but we weren't really in the position to do that. We, we, we didn't have the resources. We didn't really actually have a pastor to speak the language. We couldn't find one. So we passed with the church downtown. We said, go to this church, you know, and we trust these guys just go, you know, and, and a lot of them have actually moved on to that church and are named being pastored by that guy. Mm. We keep good connection. We have little joint events together. I think that's the future of, of Toronto and Vancouver is, is mm. just knowing and being friends with each other and not staying in your own, your own lane and saying, this is the only lane. If you don't, you're not in this lane then get out, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm the same way. Like I'm trying to get to know Korean church pastors and, and other church pastors and across the city and just to kind of know, know, know the city better. Yeah. Hmm. Bro, I've told you about, uh, this is more just me and you catching up now. Uh, maybe they'll cut this out of the interview, but, uh, have you been, we're, we're like merged with this old church in North yeah, Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so they've been there for 50 years, the primary rental group in their building is the largest Farsi speaking congregation in British Columbia yeah. and North Vancouver, this new area we're now feeling called to do ministry in is one of the highest uh, percentages of Farsi speaking individuals across Canada. I think actually the se- the highest might be in your neighborhood. This might be like second or third. And uh, so we met Absolutely. with the pastor Arash and he's like incredible. And we're collaborating and getting to know each other. And w- here's what was cool. Uh, we know to reach the neighbors in that city, we need him. We can't provide the same environment he can, but this is what he said. I I wonder if this resonates with you. He's like, when it comes to the children, the second generation, he's wondering if we can collaborate on our youth ministries. And I'm like, Hey, I'm up for anything. And so I just feel like something about that really changed my imagination because I went from being like, Oh, we've got to be all things to all people. We want to be increasingly resort, but actually I, there's another body in the body of Christ in this neighborhood that we can do this together. Absolutely. I think like if you think about an immigrant mindset, you're doing it for your, your children, right? 99% of immigrants, you know, they're saying, I, I want my child to grow up in a better place. We love Canada. So if you, if you're going to spend your energy on one area in terms of immigrants, work on the next gen, because here's what, you know, they, they did it for their children. Their children speak English. Okay. <laughs> they're eventually going to speak English. So that's, if you're going to reach them, that's where I would partner and say, hey, we can help you uh, understand their next gen better because they're not going to be mm. exactly like you. They, they got a piece of you in them, but, they, you know, and uh, we can help you with that. So mm. so that's what, uh, um, that when we, um, what we're trying to do is, you know, that there's a new Hong Kong, we call it the Hong Kong wave. It's coming to Vancouver and yeah. Toronto and yeah. to Manchester, you know, in the UK. A lot of those folks, you know, they're doing it for their children. They want a better future. And they want their children to be quote unquote, unquote, assimilated into Canadian culture, you know, whatever culture as soon as possible. So they can start moving on with their life. So when every time we talk about reaching Hong Kong immigrants, the next conversation is how can we help their youth grow? How can we Mm. evangelize and disciple the youth? Because 
a lot of these immigrant cultures, like they will put up with anything if their children are willing to come to church. <laughs> I've mm. learned that as well. So anyways, it's, I, I don't want to make it too business-like or strategy, but definitely uh, the youth are on their mind. So you're doing the right mm. thing, man. Yeah, that's great. Hmm. Um, maybe before we wrap up just personally, um, how, how are you processing your internal world, your own leadership after a really turbulent year and a half, knowing that there's real challenges still ahead in reopening? Yeah. How are you? I just know that you think thoughtfully about who you are as a leader and steps you're taking to be a healthy leader. Um, yeah. Talk to me a bit about that. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Probably all podcasts should end with that type of question. <laughs> seeing what's, uh, what's really inside. I think um, there's two, a few factors that, that um, you know, what's going on inside is, is one, we, we went through a leadership transition just before COVID. Right. So in some ways, COVID was a, you know, called blessing in disguise because it's sort of a restart for the entire church. Like your church is new, but my church is really old. So it, it sort of kickstarted a lot of the change process. It's like the mindset is like, people are just open to change. So, so we, um, I think internally, um, that's been on my mind. Like a lot of, I guess what I could have done was like simply sit back and and just relax and say, just do a digital service and that's it. But a lot of the stuff that I've been doing is sort of reorganizing and rethinking Mm. and asking people to unlearn things and processing Mm. what God's doing. Um, I think during turbulent times, it's a wake up call for the church. I think, um, part of it is to unlearn a lot of things that were became that were probably good things that became idols to the church or to the, mm. your, yourself. Uh, one of the biggest one is hurry and busyness. I, I think people were just go, 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 go. And, and, and the Asian culture is particularly known for that. It's like a work machine, a workhorse. Um, and, and just stripping all that away by force. I think it only yeah. took something like COVID because if it wasn't for COVID, there's no way anybody would have done it. But when you are stuck at home, you can't go nowhere, you can't plan your vacation, it just forces you to, to really think about, like, what's my life really about? And, and uh, what does church really even really mean, you know? So I, I would say that's the biggest lesson for me is, like, God was stripping us of some of our idols. Like, um, like the thing, the motif I've been using is, and I've been, okay, it's, it might be cheesy, but it's what I've chosen, is for our, our church's sort of theme for, for the, we call it re-entry. So I kind of think of like a spaceship in orbit. And I think the world was sort of in orbit, out of the world, so to speak, for the longest time. Like, it, like it, you, when you're in orbit, you're, are, you're in a spacesuit, you're isolated, you're relying on digital communication. You got to learn to adapt and communicate. It's an emotional toil. It's just like you're isolated. You're, you have no idea what's going on. Your senses are all over the place. But now we're sort of re-entering the, the post-COVID world. What is that going to look like? And I think um, for myself, um, I think I think I, I need this summer to to kind of recharge myself a little bit. I think a lot of mm. people are just so tired mentally yeah. because almost you had no choice. Like you could yeah. take the kid, you're stuck at home, think about the things you're doing anyways. So um, emo- you know, I think um, I would say physically, I'm in pretty good state. You know, in the sense of like, you look like, good. You look good. <laughs> no, I really, it's just because like I, I ran every day. Like I had nothing else to do. So I would run yeah. and, and do that kind of stuff. But mentally I'm quite tired Yeah. because there's so much coming at you. I think every pastor listening would agree with me. So much is coming at you. Opinions and how to deal with safety and how to even be a producer and, a, you know, doing digital stuff. All that stuff is way out of your wheelhouse most of the time. So, so I, I don't know if I trailed off and, you know, no, I appreciate it things, so much. So. I love hearing you reflect back on these things. And, you know, one thought came to mind as you're sharing at the end is like, you know, I'm by nature, I think you're a bit similar to me in this is like, you want to seize the moment for what it can be. So like, you know, you're transitioning into COVID <laughs> and you, you know, we get to work. Okay. How do we get online? How do we do these different things? Seize the moment. There's potentially like, and that's good. Like I, you know, there's those quotes that go around, like, never waste a good crisis or something like that. And that's great. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're fatigued and um, you're tired already, 
like we've got a whole kind of re-entry creativity demanded. Like there's a whole new wave of like, it's not just flick the switch back to before. It doesn't work that way because yeah. it's like the, it, now, and there's also this reality of people trying to do the dual space in person and online, maintaining that there's been reorganization structures so can take, demand new creativity. And the temptation is to seize it for the purpose of mission, evangelism, discipleship, all those good things. And I just had the thought for the first time that maybe wisdom would say for some is to to pace yourself going into this next season mm -hmm. lest you just kind of keep kind of emptying that tank i don't know how, how are you processing the pace by which you even go into this next season i i think pace is another you know in, very important word for the church as in some people are fast some people are quote unquote slower um and you got to pass through that entire church through that so i a lot of times a lot of my conversations is slowing down i mean honestly it's slowing down slow like calming down the fast fast people and then telling the slow people to pick up some of the pace and let's move together because you know the re-entry is happening yes. like everybody knows that like we want to do in-person stuff um yes I, I i'm 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 really thinking through it like i think part of it is balancing your seizing the opportunity with reflection like one of the like the two themes i'm, I'm kind of playing off of is look you got to take the lessons that you learned during covid and you start applying them that takes reflection it takes prayer um, it takes conversation, but then you also got to seize the opportunities that are ahead of you. This hybrid model mm -hmm. of we're doing ministry, all the people that are that you know, that need the gospel, you know that type of thing. So I, I don't know. I can't really give. I wish I could give you a formula, um, mm -hmm. but I, I I think maybe the way I would put it is, let's not have a spirit of fear, but a spirit of boldness. Mm -hmm. uh, boldness means there's caution. But it doesn't mean that fear is the opposite. You know, the Bible's always like, don't fear. And I think the reason is because fear excludes God from the equation. Like it's a lot of people just fearing everything and they don't want to do anything. And, and that's when you're paralyzed, right? I think be bold, be, be, be wisely cautious. Um, I think leaders need to be very clear because when you are re-entering, like think about that if a space shuttle re-enters, there's confusion on that space shuttle. There are things that are changing. You got to be clear on exactly what you're asking people to do and what you're not asking people to do. Let's be clear, you know, and, and I think lastly, be agile, you know, like mm. um, there's a lot of rigidity. I think what COVID exposed is a lot of rigidity in the way that church yeah. works. Like, I mean, I'm quite, quite jealous of the way, cause you guys are new church. There's a lot of excitement, but, but I would say 95% of churches are old churches that are like, Hey, don't touch the service yes. don't touch the time we, we we've been at nine o'clock for 50 years and people are like well okay but you know maybe we should shift shift the time because we can reach more people right so let's yeah. not be rigid about things we got to be flexible um you know i've been really thinking like the momentum that we have with 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 church at home let's not lose that either you know like, mm. like there's a lot of relationships that were built there's a lot of new people that have checked out the services online and stuff that we shouldn't lose so Let's pace ourselves, like you said. Uh, that takes a lot of wisdom, prayer, spiritual discernment, communal discernment. Um, yeah, I, I'm with you, man. I'm, I'm feeling mm. it too. Well, I appreciate you a ton, brother. And uh, let's do it again a year from now. Hopefully you and I chat. <laughs> it doesn't take a whole year. I think sure, we're going to catch sure. up later this summer. But appreciate you so much. Appreciate where God has called you to and who you are. And uh, I'm just grateful for you willing to share so much with us today. Thanks, Jason. Really appreciate it. Before you go, we want to let you know about a few things we do here at CCLN that might serve you as you lead yourself and others. We release bi-weekly interviews for you to listen to that feature conversations with incredible church leaders from across Canada and the world on our podcast called the Canadian Church Leaders Podcast. We also send out a newsletter to our network every month that contains helpful resources and content that we've curated for pastoral ministry in the Canadian context. If you're a senior pastor or you're on a trajectory towards senior leadership in the Canadian church, we run a two-year program called the Church Leaders Incubator, created for young pastors to strengthen their character and ministry for long-term effective senior leadership. So if you want to tune into our podcast, sign up for our newsletter, or learn more about the incubator, just head to cclm.ca and you'll find everything you need. Lastly, if you or your church wants to partner with CCLN in our mission to lift up and serve pastors across Canada, we'd love you to consider making a one-time or regular financial donation. You can do that or find out more at ccln.ca slash partner. Well, thanks again for checking this out. We love you all and we're cheering you on. Bye for now.